Welcome to this Autodesk Developer Summit presentation at GDC 2022 on accelerating creative workflows with Epic Games. I'm Kelly Ningwan, Industry Marketing Specialist at Autodesk, focused on elevating our games community and the incredible work that they do. Now, whether you're working in a virtual production environment or maybe building your next big game, in this session, you'll learn how we're building more robust workflows between Autodesk tools and Unreal Engine. First, we'll have Steven Roselle, Maya product manager, walk through some of the latest features of the Maya LiveLink plugin for Unreal Engine. He'll also share a sneak peek of future development that will enable artists just like yourselves work faster. Then Warren Trezevant, principal shot grid product manager, and our very special guest, Daryl Obert, technical marketer at Epic Games, will showcase how the updated shot grid and Unreal Engine integration will drive seamless collaboration for artists across teams. Now, without further ado, let's kick off the presentations. Take it away, Stephen. Hi, everybody. My name is Stephen Roselle, product manager for Maya, and I'm here today to talk to you about the Unreal Live Link for Maya plugin. So this is uh, based on a plugin that was originally created by Epic. And what it was is essentially two pieces, a Maya plugin and an Unreal plugin, that when working in tandem allow you to stream animation data uh, from Maya to Unreal. Is very much focused on character animation workflows, although you could stream things like characters and lights and general transforms, but primarily focused on character animation. So a, a while back, we connected with our friends at Epic and we decided that it made sense to, to collaborate on this workflow and, and basically focus on the areas that uh, made sense. So for, in other words, for us to focus on the Maya portion of this workflow and allow our friends at Epic to focus on the uh, unreal portion of this workflow. And so we worked together over several months and we developed the Unreal Live Link plugin for Maya, which shipped on December 15th. Uh, we made a number of improvements to the workflow, including a, a proper installation experience uh, before it was, it was very difficult to even set up and run. Uh, we created a new UI and improved the overall user experience. And we added some targeted improvements around blend shape support and time code support, uh, both of which did not work before. So blend shapes, of course, allowing you to stream facial expressions and phonemes for characters, time code support, allowing you to actually sync the timelines between the two. So I'm going to play a quick movie for you just to give you kind of an overview of all of the features uh, that we included as part of uh, the initial release. And then I want to give you a little sneak peek into some work that we have in the pipe. Hi everybody, this is Steven Rosell, product manager for Maya, and I am pleased to introduce the Unreal Live Link for Maya plugin. This is based on a collaboration from folks at Autodesk and Epic in order to provide a plugin that streamlines the workflow between Maya and Unreal. This allows you to stream data from your source assets in Maya to your target assets in Unreal. That includes transform information as well as attributes on things such as lights, like intensity, and color, as well as camera animation and associated data. So here you'll see a camera fly through of an environment that is animated in Maya, but you can see that animation streaming live in Unreal with all of the real-time effects that you would expect. Now, the most important aspect of this, of course, is character animation. It allows you to build your complex rigs inside of Maya and then stream the result of the animation to the equivalent target skeleton inside of Unreal in the context of real-time lighting, real-time shading, and any other effects that you may have in Engine. Some of the new workflows and new features that we've added include timecode streaming, which allows you to sync the timeline between Maya and Unreal and match the playheads. In addition to that, we've also added support for blend shapes, allowing you to stream things like phonemes and lip syncing between your source assets in Maya and Unreal. All of this is in addition to a simplified installation and a new user interface. So you can see there's a lot of functionality already in the tool as it is today. So give it a whirl if you haven't tried it out already. Uh, you can go to the Autodesk App Store to download it. Uh, of course, there's the link from the, the, uh, the Epic Store. Uh, but now I want to show you a little window into something we're working on. Uh, so what you see here is, is the Safe Harbor Statement, which basically says this is a, a technology preview. We're not announcing anything. We're not talking about actually shipping this. This is something we're exploring today, but no guarantees on shipping. So don't make any purchasing decisions based on what you're about to see. But that said, I'd like to show you a cool prototype of some, some interesting functionality that we have, have in the pipe. And so my friend, uh, Matt Harwood, is going to walk you through some of the work they're doing. 
So in this video, what we're going to do is just go over prototype version of um, uh, Unreal Live Links, as well as some prototype UI you'll see. Uh, so first thing we're going to do is actually just give an overview of the level as well. You can see there's a set that um, we set up here. Um, it's from the marketplace. Uh, it's called Sci-Fi Hallway. And I have exported some of the geometry into Maya just to be able to get some reference. But what I want to do is start to see uh, the animation that I have working right now in context and uh, start to build up a shot. So I've already placed the skeleton into the level here. And what we'll do is uh, add the rig to the Unreal Live Link to start setting it up for uh, synchronization. So I chose this timeline uh, type, which is new. And it's just to set up some of the uh, new code base that we're building for it. Uh, but the idea is that you have uh, you'll add a rig directly to the list and then be able to go and link it to an object inside of Unreal. And as you can see here, this uh, is the temporary UI I was talking about, uh, where we'll display all the skeletons. Since Unreal knows that this is a rig, um, that you're potentially uh, trying to manipulate a character, it assumes that we're going to try to link it to a skeleton and thus uh, also link it to potential relevant animations that are associated with that skeleton. So robot character actor one skeleton I've clicked on. I know it's the same one here. And there's an animation present inside of Unreal. You can see it here. Uh, but what we want to do is create a brand new animation. So we'll create it and link. And as soon as I accomplish that task, it starts to bake out the animation live to the U asset file on disk. It's no more FBX export here for the animation specifically. It's linking it directly to a U asset and live baking down the frames from that particular animation. I can preview this animation in two ways. I can bring it up in the animation editor here and then uh, an animation preview browser that uh, Unreal has and then uh, select this Maya Live Link preview controller. And then as you can see, as soon as I start scrubbing the timeline, it's scrubbing in in Unreal, I can grab the Unreal Timeline too, and it's bi-directional timeline sync, which is helpful. So for example, if I start uh, adjusting uh, the keys inside of, inside of Maya here, I have auto key on, so it's adjusting it in real time. You can see it also over here in uh, Unreal. This uh, new change that I made, uh, live bake that change to, directly to the asset that's sitting here in Unreal. So if I were to, uh, all of a sudden Maya shuts down or I shut it down and I want to get out of here, there's an asset that's sitting there in memory in Unreal ready to be used. So let's actually do that. Let's set up a sequence here. I have a test sequence already set up. I'll open it up. Let's make sure my, my skeleton is selected in the level so I can add it to this particular sequence. There it is. And I'm going to choose the animation that I just synchronized to. Let's make sure it's at frame zero. And I'll uh, open up the uh, sequence uh, start and stop a little bit. And there you go. Right away, you can see uh, that animation is being played back with inside the sequence. And I'm able to see that uh, live inside of Unreal. In our previous video, we went through attaching a character directly to an animation. And then you could see that we were live updating that animation on disk in real time. Uh, allowing for you guys to be able to manipulate animations in context of however you're utilizing that animation sequence in Unreal. But what we can also do is things like camera synchronization. So let's do that. First, I'll create a camera, add it to the list here, go down to live uh, to level sequence, which again is the new prototype way of working. We'll uh, select an asset to link to, and since the two projects are linked together, we're able to know that it's a camera and then be able to see if there's any cameras inside of your particular level. And if I go over here and filter, there it is, camera actor. There's one called camera actor. And it also shows us a potential sequence that we could tie it to. Let's create a brand new camera here, and we'll call it a, a robot cam. And we can select the different types of cameras to instantiate into Unreal. Let's just select Camera Actor here. This could potentially be a camera blueprint that would allow you to send custom attributes to, as long as the strings are correct and uh, identical from Maya to Unreal. But let's create this uh, new Camera a uh, Actor here. That's created, and now let's also link it to a new sequence. So let's create a new sequence, call it uh, Robo Sequence SEQ and uh, create and then we'll link it. 
And you can see here, it's created a brand new sequence, a robot sequence. It also made the camera appear. You can see it inside the level. So let's open up that sequence, and it automatically added that robot camera to the sequence here. Um, but you notice it's in kind of a strange position. Uh, you can see that if I uh, select a robot cam, it's in the floor, because when, it, uh, when Unreal creates that camera, it puts it into a, a, a strange position. So let's fix that by um, selecting our camera. It's hard to see, so let's increase its size inside of Maya. We'll pull its position up, give it kind of a relative position, and then as soon as I add it, uh, a key to it here, it'll snap to that position. It'll send its key over into Unreal and uh, put the camera wherever I've placed it inside of Maya. Cameras and props, lights, they function uh, slightly different than characters. Characters, we're tying them directly to an animation sequence, which lives bakes out the data directly to that sequence, but uh, for using props, cameras, and lights, we can tie those objects to a level sequence and retain um, the, the keys. So, for example, if, um, if I just go here and add a camera move, um, but you can see the keys show up right here inside of Unreal. So we have a retention without baking the frames out to Unreal for specifically cameras, lights, and props. We can also select that camera and then see uh, a live update, if I can grab it here, of that particular curve inside of Unreal. You can uh, adjust the, the Bezier curve here or uh, select different kinds of curves and they'll translate, translate directly into Unreal. You notice if I try to manipulate it here in Unreal, as soon as I uh, scrub the timeline over in Maya, it pushes that data over. So this is a one-way push. It's a mixture, right? The only thing that is bi-directional in this case is the playhead sync. Right? But everything else is being pushed into Unreal uh, one way. I can also take some of the other components inside of Unreal and uh, key them on top, right? So let's change the uh, field of view, and then at the end we'll we'll scale it out here and add another key. Well, let's go let's go out, dolly and zoom out, um, so you can get that kind of Spielbergy. So you can see that I'm uh, previewing this. Now notice the uh, character is not actually moving. That's because he's not um, connected uh, inside of the sequence. So let's select his skeleton and add him to this particular track. Uh, again, put his uh, animation on and now both are going to be playing back. And I can adjust his animation. Again, some of that jitter that you're seeing here is going to go away. But uh, you can sort of see the workflow here where I'm able to instantiate and create a camera, put it into my level, as well as uh, see those curves inside of Unreal and retain them. So if I were to shut down Maya, for example, the animation asset that was exported and previously linked is still sitting inside of Unreal, as is the new sequence that I've tied this camera to. Uh, but that's pretty cool. Thanks, Matt. So again, just to reiterate, uh, this is uh, a prototype that we're demonstrating. This is not something that we're announcing, but we are really excited about the, the potential. So stay tuned on that front, and uh, we will uh, hopefully be able to show you more in the future. So now I'm going to pass it off to Daryl O'Bear from Epic Games and Warren Trezevant, Senior Product Manager for ShotGrid, and they're going to walk you through the latest ShotGrid integration with Unreal Engine. Hi, my name is Warren Trezevant, and I'm the Principal Product Manager for ShotGrid. Today, we'll be showcasing the updated ShotGrid integration for Unreal, which makes it easier for artists working with ShotGrid to spend more time being creative inside applications like Unreal. ShotGrid is a web-based production management solution designed for large, complex creative projects that offers production teams a single source of truth for all their production data. And connecting artists to this production database is critical in making sure a project stays on track. ShockGrid is a great way for producers, supervisors, and leads to assign work to artists and track the progress of that work all the way through to completion. Today, one of the artists on our project, Daryl Obert, has a task to complete the assembly work on a sci-fi truck asset. I'll go ahead and assign this work to Daryl and change the status from waiting to start to in progress.
Now, Daryl can use the shock grid integrations for Maya, as well as the updated integration for Unreal, to make sure he knows what he should be working on and has all the information he needs to successfully complete his work in his creative application, Unreal. Thanks, Wern. So we're actually gonna start this project off inside of Maya. And the first thing that I wanna do is bring up the shot grid UI that I have docked on the right-hand side. So with that open, you can see that we have a variety of different things that we can view and work with directly inside of the host application. So we're currently looking at our recent activity. Looks like I was doing some Photoshop work on the tires last night. We can view all the different notes associated with the project, as well as the versions of the files that we've been working with any publishes that we've made, and most importantly, we can view the tasks that have been assigned for me just recently by Warren. And these are the tasks that we're gonna be doing throughout today's demo. So the first task is to get this truck assembly out and into Unreal. So the truck has got a basic setup of a skeletal structure with some binding done, some skin weight set up so that if I grab something like some of the suspension parts and start moving around, it basically is going to all work and, and we wanna carry all that information and rigging information across into Unreal. And this is easily done by just exporting out an FBX file first. So we're gonna grab the skeleton as well as the static meshes and we're going to say file, export selection, and we're gonna save this out as an FBX. So we'll just overwrite the truck FBX. We'll save that out and we'll just go ahead and tell it to export that. So once we have this saved to disk, the next thing that I want to do is I want to publish this information into ShotGrid. So this is very easy to do. You just go to the ShotGrid dropdown and you say publish. This is gonna bring up the publisher. And what we want to publish is obviously the Maya file as well as that FBX file. So I'm just gonna click the browse button browse out to that truck FBX and we'll select that also. So we're gonna save a Maya file and the truck FBX file. And we're going to assign this to that sci-fi truck assemble task. With that done, I'm gonna go ahead and just grab a snapshot of this and I'll just give it some notes that just says truck rig, cause it's got a basic rig on it. Okay, cool. So with that done, we're just gonna go ahead and click the publish button, and it's gonna go ahead and save that information out into ShotGrid. All right, so it looks like that publish has been completed. Next, we're gonna go ahead and integrate this truck into an Unreal project. And to do that, we're going to be using the ShotGrid desktop application to launch Unreal. By launching your applications through the ShotGrid desktop, it allows them to open in a pre-configured state for the current project that you have selected, in this case, Interspace Challenge. So we'll just click on the Unreal icon to go ahead and load up the Unreal project browser. And we're gonna go and select an Unreal project that's going to be the stage that we're gonna integrate this truck into. So it's gonna be this kind of sci-fi, rocky world built with a variety of Quixel assets. So we'll open that project. Now it's worth noting that when this project opens, it's going to be in Unreal's unlit state. That means there's no lighting in the scene and it's showing us just the pure base color. We're gonna be doing the look dev work a bit later on. So here we are inside of Unreal. And as you can see, we have a shot grid drop down in our toolbar. So I'm just gonna bring up the shot grid panel and you'll notice that this is exactly the same user interface element that we had inside of Maya. So this makes working with ShotGrid very easy because it's a consistent experience across the applications that you're using on the project. So again, the task that we're gonna be working on is assembling this truck into the scene. So we wanna go ahead and get that loaded in. That's very easily done by using the ShotGrid loader. So we'll bring up the loader and we'll jump into props. We'll go to sci-fi truck and we'll just double click on that FBX file to begin integrating it into our Unreal project. Okay, so FBX file is in and you will notice that the folder structure in Unreal matches exactly what was defined in ShotGrid, which is pretty awesome. Now we wanna create a control rig so that we can position and animate this truck. And that's done by right clicking on top of the FBX file and selecting create control rig. That gets added into the content browser. And if we double click on that to bring the editor up, you can see that we've obviously got the viewport here with the skeletal structure and the rig hierarchy that was defined inside of Maya. 
Now, in the control rig graph window is where we're gonna be doing the majority of the work. This is where you make relationships between controls and the bones you wanna have them influence. And then of course the details panel is on the right hand side. All right, so we're gonna look at two things in this presentation. We're gonna start off simple and make a relationship between one control and one bone to drive the front wheel. And then we're gonna do something a bit more sophisticated. Control rigs are extremely flexible and we're gonna tap into their ability to create dynamic connections between skeletons and controls to kind of automate the process of setting up a bunch of controls across the hierarchy of this truck. So let's start off simple by creating a new control for the front wheel. So we'll go up to elements and we'll make a new controller. That's going to drop in at the origin by default. So with that done, let's just go ahead and start to position that kind of close to the bone that I want to have it ultimately driving or influencing. So we'll get it kind of close. And then I'm going to right click in the viewport and say, set initial transform from closest bone. So by doing that, you can see in the details panel, it's location and rotation matches what was defined inside of Maya, which is pretty straightforward. So the next thing that I want to do is just change the draw style of this controller to something different than the gizmo. So we have a pretty extensive list of different draw styles. I'm going to grab something simple like the box thick. So that now represents that handle with a slightly different UI element that's a little bit easier to select. So with that done, it's time to start making some relationships. We want to wire these guys together. So we're going to expand this rig uh, hierarchy out one more time. I'm gonna grab this front turn one bone and just drag and drop that in my graph. When I do that, I'm going to tell it that I want to set the transform. So by setting the transform, it's automatically hooked into the forward solve. Everything we're doing in this demo is forward solving. And examples of forward solving would be inverse kinematics, forward kinematics, um, whole IK systems or full body IK systems. These are all examples of forward solves and, and we're gonna be doing essentially forward uh, you know, FK on everything in this scene. Um, so it's gonna be a bunch of controllers directly influencing bones. So we've got that set. The next thing we wanna do is bring in the controller. So we're gonna drag that in. And this time we're gonna do a get controller. We wanna get its information and we wanna have its transform information set the transform information for that bone. So we'll just wire those together. The final step is to turn on propagate the children. We want the children to go along for the ride of their parents. Really straightforward. So if we hit the space bar to go back to our rotation tool, you can see I've now got a simple little setup um, done. A little, little controller ultimately driving the position of a bone, um, which, is, which is exactly what we needed to do for the simple example. So the next thing that I wanna do is I want to replicate this across the whole hierarchy of the skeleton. Now, of course I could go in here and I could start saying, make another new controller, you know, position that guy, right click and say, set initial position, and then come in here and, you know, drag out the bones and drag out the controllers and, and string together a whole series of sets and connects. And that's gonna be a lot of clicking. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do this dynamically and um, it's gonna be pretty cool. Hopefully you guys will like it. So let's go ahead and get rid of this work here. We don't need that guy and we don't need this guy and we can get rid of this stuff. So to accelerate the process a bit, what I've done is I've actually gone ahead and I've already made a matching hierarchy of controls that matches the hierarchy of, of my skeletal setup. So if I just paste that in here, you can see all of those controls come in at the origin, just like the control that we generated. I did change a few of the gizmos just to make them uh, match up and be a little bit more um, representational of what we're trying to do. But you'll notice that the naming structure for my skeleton and for my rigs, my controls are exactly the same. I just have understore CTRL at the end. So what we wanna do is we want to first make all of these controls be positioned correctly. They're currently at the origin. That's not what we want. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do something called a setup event. And a setup event lets us kind of prime our control handles. And we're going to use a setup event to position these to where the bones are with the matching names. So we're gonna switch over to a setup event and I'm going to right click in my graph window and create a new setup event. So for this new setup event, what I wanna do is I want to take every one of these controls. So I'm gonna just grab all of them and I'm gonna drag them into the graph window and I'm going to create a collection from these. So it's just an array, it's every single bone we've made an array from those. And when we close this down, you can see that it's called a collection. Now keep in mind 
There's lots of ways that you can create and work with collections. I just did the simplest one, which is dragging them in from the rig hierarchy window and making an array. But you could grab hierarchy or children or do some naming things and, and, and do lots of fun things with, with collections. So just keep that in mind. So on our setup event, what we wanna do is we wanna run a for each loop. For every item in this array, I want to have it go match its corresponding named bone. So we're gonna drag out and we're gonna do a for each, for each item. So for each item in this collection, we'll wire these together. What do we wanna do? We wanna set the offset of the controller. Pretty straightforward. Now, we don't wanna set that for just one controller. We wanna set that for the whole list of the controller. So we're just gonna wire name into that guy. And this is sitting here waiting now for something to pipe into this offset to set it, to set it right? And what do we wanna have piped into the offset? We want to have the, the bones, the name of the bones. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing is we need to get the name of the bones, right? So instead of making another collection, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull off of name and I'm going to use a chop. So what chop does is it lets me pull off the last five characters of the name. So if we just put this to five, I now have a list of um, every bone in the scene, essentially, because we used a chop to generate that name. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a get. And what we wanna do is get the transform of the bone. And again, we don't want just one bone. We want this list of bones that we just made with that chop action. So watch this, this is really pretty cool. All I have to do now is wire the transform up. So as soon as I drop this on here, just like that, all of those controls now are positioned based off of their matching bone name. Really straightforward, really simple. So we've used a setup event to prime and configure our controls. Um, and hopefully that makes sense for you. It's, you know, four nodes versus a lot of clicking and setting that would have happened in the viewport if I did that manually. Um, so hopefully you see the power of that. So the next thing that we wanna do is kind of the opposite. We wanna now take those controls and have them drive the transforms of those bones. So I'm gonna go ahead and just grab this and this and this, and we're gonna duplicate it and we're gonna hook up a for each loop um, that's gonna kind of do the opposite thing. So we're gonna say our for each loop on our forward solve is going to go through. And what do we what do we want it to do? Well, we wanna have it set the position or the transform of a bone. So we're gonna say set transform. So it's gonna go through and do a set bone transform. And again, what name do we want? Well, we want the name of the bones, which is this little chop command here. So we're just gonna wire that up right there. So now we've got this set transform. This is just like the wheel. It's just, instead of having a you know one-to-one -one relationship of one bone to one control handle, we're, we're running through a loop. So the, the next thing that we're gonna do is we want to get the position of um, a, not a bone, but a controller. So we're gonna say get the position of a control, oops, not a space, a controller. And what do we wanna get the, the name of? It's this list right here. So again, we're just gonna wire that guy up just like that. And if we come over here and as soon as we hook up this transform, we've now got a rig. So if we hit compile and we grab this, this, uh, this little handle, this little controller here and start to rotate that guy, you can see that you know, it's, all, it's all basically hooked up and ready to go. So it's, it's really that simple to go through and, and um, you know, use a few nodes to dynamically set up this whole hierarchy in this whole rig. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys and you understand the power and, and you know, you can, you can see areas where you could use something like that in your workflow. So let's go ahead and drop this truck into our scene and start looking at the look dev that I did for the, uh, for the final piece. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and drop that truck into our Quixel environment, the control rig of it, and use that control rig to adjust uh, how the tires are kind of sitting on the ground and things like that. So we wanna get this sort of truck you know, sitting in an area where we can kind of fine tune it and, and get it looking like the, the contact patches for the, for the tires are kind of working. So I'm just gonna run through this really quickly and just sort of adjust a few of these uh, controllers on the truck to make it to make it look great. All right, so this next section is really fun. We're gonna be talking about look development and setting up the exterior lighting model using the sky atmosphere, which is crazy powerful inside of Unreal. 
I'm basically just gonna walk you through the process and share with you a few of the things along the way. So hopefully we end up in a good spot and it looks cool. I do apologize. I know I'm gonna be going quick, um, but we're, we're kind of running out of time. So the first thing I wanna do is turn on the lit mode. So in the lit mode, there's no lights in the scene. It's black. There are some emissive materials kicking off that glow. So let's go ahead and get some light in here by dropping in a directional light. So with that directional light dropped in, I hit the G key to display the icons to get back into game mode. And we're gonna switch its mobility to movable. Everything that we're doing in the scene is going to be dynamically lit and I already have ray tracing turned on. The next thing that I wanna do is just drop in the sky atmosphere. Now there was no change that happened when I dropped that in and that's because the sky atmosphere hasn't been connected to any lights in the scene. So what we wanna do is we want to tell this skylight here or this directional light that it's going to be the sunlight for the atmosphere. So we're just gonna to toggle on this switch. And as soon as we do that, you can see as I rotate this light around, its angle dries where the sun is in the sky. It's worth mentioning that the sky atmosphere now in return is driving the color temperature of this direct light. So it's all connected. And that's really the theme throughout this. All of these different things that we're gonna be playing with play off of each other and are connected in some way. So keep that in mind as we, as we move through this. So the next thing we wanna do is get a hemisphere of light that represents um, the indirect lighting model. So that's gonna be done with a skylight. So we'll just drop that in. And again, we'll go back and switch the mobility to movable. And we're gonna turn on the real-time capture. This lets the skylight get its color information and intensity driven from the sky atmosphere. So we'll just turn that on. So those guys are now connected to each other. The next thing that we're gonna do is search out for ray. I want to ray trace the shadows of our, of our skylight. So we'll just turn that guy on and set this up to something like six. Now the next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to turn off the ray trace shadows on our sunlight or our direct light. And the reason I'm doing that is the volume model that we're gonna put in here, I want to be able to cast shadows into that volumetric fog. And that is only possible with non-ray trace shadows. So we're just gonna turn this off on the sunlight. It will still look really cool in the end, I promise you. All right, so now that we've done that, let's just kind of move around here and reposition the sun sort of over here. And let's just drop that sun down. And you can see as I move the sun through the sky here, you know, it, it basically all just works and everything's connected, right? That's, that's the point that we want to make. So let's go ahead and drop in a post-process volume to begin fine tuning a few things before we move any further. So post-process volumes in Unreal are crazy powerful. They're like a Swiss army knife. So we're going to use it to do a few things today. Let's go ahead and drop it in there. The first thing that we want to do is we want to tell this post-process volume that it lives everywhere. So let's just scroll down to the extend infinite and turn that on. The next thing that we wanna do is use the post-process volume to adjust the exposure. I wanna clamp this down a little bit. So we're gonna turn the metering mode on to use auto exposure, but I'm gonna limit the range, the min and max EV that it can use to a pretty small value. So we're, we're kind of, we're still gonna have some adaptiveness to it, but it's going to be um, pretty small. Now, the other thing that I wanna do is I actually wanna pull this down a stop. It still feels a little bright and I know it's going to continue to get brighter as I add more stuff in. So I'm gonna use the exposure compensation just to, just to drop this down a stop. So that's looking a little bit better. Now, the next thing that I'm gonna use the post-process volume to do is to remove some of the noise in the ray traced reflections. The broad highlights are a bit noisy. So that's done by going down into the rendering features and finding some of the ray trace reflection attributes and adjusting them. So samples per pixel, we're just gonna crank that up to something like 10. And you can see as soon as I do that, we've removed that noise. The next thing that I wanna do is I actually want to have the ray tracer handle more rough surfaces. So right now there is a threshold and anything that's below that threshold is traced and anything above that threshold kicks back to the standard raster renderer. I'm just gonna increase that range up to something like 0.8 so that more of these rough surfaces are using the actual ray tracer. And that starts to look, uh, starts to look pretty good. All right, cool. So the next thing that we want to do is we wanna go ahead and just look at the sky atmosphere. One more thing that's kind of fun about the sky atmosphere, and that is, you know, there's a lot of control inside of here for adjusting 
how that scattering of light is working through the environment. So a simple one is just adjusting the scatter scale. If we start to add more dust into the scene, you know, it starts to look like LA or maybe Mars or something like that. So lots of control for adjusting and making otherworldly looks and effects inside of the actual sky atmosphere. And we'll play with that a bit more a little later in the demo. So let's get that back to the default value. By default, everything's set up like Earth, essentially. That's the best way to think of it. So if we move this sun sort of over here and a little bit lower in the sky, there's one more thing I want to adjust in that post-process volume, and that's the way the bloom works. Right now, we just have this little spherical bloom on the sun that kind of bleeds on and off as it moves behind that rock. And I want to change that to have more of a starburst look. And that's easily done by adjusting the model that the bloom uses, the, the method. So we're gonna go back to bloom and we're going to switch that from standard to convolution. And as soon as I do that, we now have that little, that little starburst effect and you can see how much prettier that is as, as it drops behind there. It's worth mentioning that that starburst effect is going to happen off of the glints and, and, and you know, little, little pops that happen from the reflection on the, on the actual you know, truck here too. I'll try to get one to, yeah, you can see right there. Like there's that little starburst effect kind of blowing off of the, off of the sci-fi dump truck. So that looks pretty cool. So we've got the basics here. Let's go and start to layer some more effects in. Let's add in some fog, some, some volumetric fog. That's a great thing to look at next. So I'm going to drag and drop in the exponential height fog. Now exponential height fog existed before the sky atmosphere it also had the ability to scatter light in the atmosphere. So right now we actually have a doubling effect happening, which we do not want. So to work around that, you just turn off the sky the, the fog scatter colors on the exponential height fog and it will give you the correct results, combining those two together, which is kind of cool. Now the next thing that we're gonna do is the magic button in the exponential height fog we're going to turn on the volumetric fog. And as soon as we do that, you can see that we start to get, you know, this little God ray effect happening, those little volume shafts. And I'm just gonna overdrive this so you can see it a little bit more clearly there as, as, I, as I move my camera, you know, through the scene here, you can see that little volume fog effect sort of happening. And obviously if we come back here and, and look at the back of the dump truck, there's that shaft being carved in by that big rock. Um, let's just escape out of that guy. and you know, kind of wiggle around here. And you can see, same thing happening as, as we pull this off the back of the, the truck here. You get this really nice little, little God Ray thing sort of happening off the, back of that, uh, off the back of that truck. Now, what I'm gonna do is I don't want that volume fog going quite as high in the sky as it is. So we'll go back and we'll start to, to adjust some of those attributes. So exponential height fog, I'm gonna give it a little bit more fall off as it goes up so that we get back to that nice, like, like, nice rich blue sky but we still have this volume fog, you know, capturing and, and, and carving in rays sort of on, on, the, um, on the lower surfaces here, which, which starts to look pretty, pretty cool. Now, the next thing that I want to do is I actually want to adjust the scatter distribution. So look at the effect as I start to increase this. It's going to make the scatter be more pronounced on the direct light. So as, as we move through here, you can see that we start to get that, you know, more a hot spot around that sun. And that's gonna give me really what I want here. So if we kind of come in here and start to dip this guy down, you know, you get this really nice effect happening with that, with that volume fog. Um, it starts to look really pretty and, and quite, quite lovely, I think. Okay, cool. So now that we've got our volume fog sort of dialed in, let's go ahead and add in our clouds, our volume clouds. And this is, uh, this is really fun and really cool. So let's go ahead and go back to place actors and drag and drop in the volumetric cloud. Now, as soon as I do that, you could see that the scene got much brighter, right? As I turn this on and off, it's gonna be darker. We turn the clouds on, it's gonna be brighter. That's because there's all this extra bounce happening from the cloud in the atmosphere that makes the indirect model be brighter, which is, which is kind of cool and what you'd expect. And these are the default values on the clouds when you just drop them in. Now they are true volume clouds, right? So if we adjust the, the bottom layer, we could, we could lower those down, we could rise those up higher in the atmosphere, um, we could adjust how tall they are. So lots of control on the clouds. And we don't have too much time to really play with all the attributes, but I will, I will just kind of play around with it and make slightly different looks with, with these guys. So let's go ahead and play with some of the attributes on these. So the next thing that I want to adjust is I'm gonna turn shadows on for volume clouds. So if we go back to the light, you'll notice that there's some cloud attributes 
on the actual light. So in the atmosphere settings here, we can turn on cast cloud shadows. Now, this is going to make the scene darker because my sun is now behind a giant dark cloud. And you can see that we've actually cast shadows into the volumes of those clouds. So we want to adjust this. Like we're going to want to change a few of these attributes here. This is a little strong. I want to get a little bit sense of that directionality back into that light. So we're going to turn down the shadow on surface strength down to something like, I don't know, 0.3. So we're sort of blending between the two now so that we still have a little bit of that volume fog coming through with that shadow and we get some directionality on, on the ground from that, from that directional light. So that starts to look a little bit better. Now, the next thing that I want to do is go back into the volume clouds and start to play around with a few of the attributes on those. So I'm going to do a couple things here. The, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the intensity or the number of samples that we're using just to kind of clean these guys up and make them look a little bit higher quality. I'm also going to turn on the use per sample at atmospheric light transmit. So that looks a little bit better. And I'm going to give it a little bit more of, of the tracing rate so that it's going to kind of add in a little bit more detail into those guys. And I'm also going to drop down that sky bright a little bit on those guys, the ambient occlusion to just make those a little bit more blue. So again, it starts to look a lot different than it did with the default values. Now, the next thing that I want to do is I want to make these be a little more detailed. I don't want them quite this soft. That's easily done by modifying some of the attributes on the actual cloud material. And there's a lot of them, right? So we're just going to increase the noise height range from 2.5 to 25. And as soon as I do that, you can see now they start to look a lot more detailed. Um, they, they just look really cool and pretty. And of course, you know, we can go back in here and, and say, you know what, maybe they're a little too tall. Let's, let's, let's lower that, that height down a little bit. So lots and lots of control inside of here. So the final thing that I want to do is I'm actually going to change the size of my planet. We're going to go back to our sky atmosphere. And in that guy, we're going to make this like a little tiny planet, like 600. So that's going to drop those clouds down a little bit closer to the, uh, to the, to the ground. It's a smaller, it's a smaller planet, much smaller. I'm going to decrease my radius of my, or of my atmosphere. So this is in kilometers. Like we're going to make it a little bit lower. And you can see, look, if, if we don't have sky atmosphere, we're out in space, it's going to be black. So it's just going to be a kind of a thinner atmosphere, less, less intense in the atmosphere. And the final thing that I want to do is I'm just going to play around with the, the volume cloud height here. I'm just going to drop that bottom layer a little bit lower so that they're really kind of low in the sky here. And I'm going to increase the height on those guys. And that overall look and feel now is, uh, is, is a lot different than what we had before. And it starts to look really pretty cool and, and pretty fun. So let's go ahead and hit the G key to turn everything off. And the final thing that I want to do is I want to just render out a camera sequence for Warren to look at in shot grid and to, uh, you know, let me know what he thinks. So to do that, we're going to go up to sequence. We're going to create a new level sequence. We'll just hit save on that guy. And I'm going to create a new camera in this level sequence. Now I'm going to make this be, I don't know, maybe like a 20. So, or, heck, we'll go even, we'll go even wider. We'll go 18 so that I can kind of pull back on this guy. And I'm just going to set a couple keyframes on this camera to kind of just do, a, just do a little push across the truck here. You know, something kind of like, oop, I don't want that rock in there. Let's kind of push forward here ever so slightly. So that looks kind of cool. So we'll go to our camera. And for our camera, we're going to set a keyframe. We'll move forward to 150. We'll just kind of pivot and push and kind of just, you know, move across here. Something kind of like that. I don't know. I think that looks that looks kind of cool. Here, we'll look up in the sky a little bit more just just for fun. And we'll set one more keyframe. And now we can kind of scrub through that guy. You know, really simple little thing. So, what we want to do is publish this out to Shotgrid. All right, so let's just jump back out to the content browser. We're going to right click on top of this level sequence and we're going to tell it to publish to Shotgrid. So, the window looks exactly the same as it did inside of Maya. They're always consistent across the applications, which is great. We'll grab a thumbnail that represents the work that we did. We'll specify the task that we want to go to, and we'll just call this DTO fun. And we will go ahead and hit publish. So what this is going to do is it's going to fire off the movie render queue. Very powerful tool inside of Unreal for creating linear media. 
and it's going to make a sequence of images that are uh, actually a QuickTime ProRes movie that will then get pushed up into ShotGrid for Warren to review. So it takes just a second to, uh, to render that out, and we will now upload it into ShotGrid. And just like that, we are done. Awesome, so I will hand it back to Warren. Thanks, Daryl. Looking at the assembly task in ShotGrid, I see Daryl marked his work complete, which means the other artists or teams who were dependent on Daryl's work can now make use of everything he published to ShotGrid with the ShotGrid publisher. I was also notified that Daryl has some media that needs review. I'll pop over to the shot Daryl was working on, and I see the shot here. Clicking on the thumbnail plays the media, and I think this initial camera pass looks good. To let Daryl know this, I'll open the notes panel and let Daryl know he can go ahead and begin refining the camera movement. The next time Daryl looks at his shot grid panel inside of Unreal, he'll see my note and can immediately continue working. As you see, the updated integration of ShotGrid in Unreal is a quick and easy way to communicate with your artists in the application they're working in, make sure they're working on the right thing, and to make sure their work is immediately available for everyone else on the project to use. Together, ShotGrid and Unreal help artists remain in their creative flow so they can do their best work. Be sure to check out the updated ShotGrid integration for Unreal for all your production workflows. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen, Daryl, and Warren for those fantastic presentations. Now, if you'd like to learn more about the Maya Live Link, please visit our What's New in Maya page at makeanything.autodesk.com forward slash Maya, where you'll find all the latest features in the Maya Live Link, as well as a ton of resources and tutorials to get you started. I also invite you to visit our ShotGrid community site at community.shotgridsoftware.com where you can find answers to all of your burning questions and connect with the larger ShotGrid community. And finally, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all that jazz so you can stay in the loop and stay connected with us. And with that, I wish you a fantastic rest of your GDC. See you in the next one.